Hello, today is September 27th, 2012. We're meeting today with Mr. Benjamin Duncan at his home in Fort Collins, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Ben, and thanks for sitting down today to, to tell your story. Well, thank you for being here, Brad. Let's start out, if we could. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. Well, I was born out in the country east of Essex, Iowa, in a farmhouse. And uh, if I remember correctly, it was around between 8 and 9 in the evening. And uh, the date was 25 October 1927. And so this coming month I'll be 85. And uh, I've had a nice, long, enjoyable life. Uh, so uh, I take it your father was a farmer then, or what? Yes, my father was a farmer. He grew up in uh, Indiana. My mother had uh, been born and raised basically about the same place I was in, in southwest Iowa. And uh, they had met, oh, I don't know the exact year, but it was shortly after 1900. Hmm. My dad had moved from Indiana. He had two brothers that had moved from Indiana to Omaha. Nebraska, and he followed him out, and he had a job in a candy factory. He was a bookkeeper for them in the candy factory, and uh, my mother was uh, in Omaha going to sewing school, and they met, and there it went. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'll be darned. Uh, any brothers and sisters? I uh, had a sister and a brother, both older than I, and they are both deceased. Mm -hmm. They've gone ahead of me. Yeah. Well, one question I always like to ask before we move into your uh, into your military uh, career, uh, I don't know that you would have much memory of it, but was your was your family much affected by the Great Depression? Uh, well, yes, they they were bothered by the Great Depression. I can remember basically at the end of it. But uh, there, there was not a lot of progress at that time, and my mother's uh, parents lost their farm during this. It was an outstanding farm ground there uh, east of Essex, Iowa, oh, five or six miles. And that, this part of uh, Iowa is some of the best farmland that in Iowa, other than in the north central part, hmm. yeah, wow. it was, it was a good uh, farming area. Wow, that'll be darn. So uh, you grew up and went through the school system there in, in Essex. Uh, no, uh, after I uh, had grown some, well, quite a bit, <laughs> I started a school east of uh, Villisca, Iowa. Well, it was east and south of Stanton, Iowa. It was a country school, one room schoolhouse, all kids in uh, all eight grades, one teacher. Wow. And uh, that's the way I started the school. Uh -huh. And I did, uh, oh, let's see, a couple of years there and uh, my dad didn't own a farm, he rented. Okay. So I don't know the reason why they moved and changed farms, but uh, after, well, I guess it was about in the middle of the third grade, they moved to uh, west of Stanton. And I went to another school, which was two miles west of the first one that I started in. <laughs> And, well, the first one, the name of the school was Scott Center, and the second one, the name of it was Lombardi. And uh, there I was, uh, oh, I was in the middle of the sixth grade and moved up by Grant, which was, 
oh, about 15 miles north and a little east of where I started. And uh, then shortly, well, we was there two years. My dad was uh, injured pretty bad in a farm accident. He'd been mowing hay and the uh, horse was one of the team was kind of an ornery thing and he was uh, had just screwed the grease cup down on the pitman pitman rod on the mowing machine that you had to do quite often and his horse cut loose and kicked him and the hoof landed right in his left cheek and uh, it was a really bad accident. His mouth was, his, the roof of his mouth was split into three pieces and his left eye wound up a half inch lower than the right eye. And uh, the farm that we were on there at Grant was uh, too much. So they bought 160 acres just a little ways from uh, north and west of Villisca. It was river bottom ground that was uh, really good ground, but it had, did have some wet spots where there had been uh, old channels from years ago that had been filled in, but uh, didn't worry any about that because the topsoil on that farm was, there was about 15 feet of topsoil. <coughs> mm, yeah. Me down. yeah. And that, that is where I, uh, I finished uh, my grade school. All of these schools so far have been one-room schoolhouses. And I had another one-room schoolhouse, which was about four miles, five miles east of where I started. And uh, it was probably the nicest building for a, a one-room schoolhouse that we had. It actually had a a floor furnace in it <laughs> and uh, I finished uh, my grade schools there graduated from eighth grade and then I went to high school in Villisca, Iowa all four years there and what year did you graduate from high school? Uh, 1946, 1946 graduated yeah. from high school and uh, Things weren't all the greatest at that time on the farm, and my uh, brother had just come home from the military. So he uh, uh, was off in World War II then. Yes. What can you talk a little bit about what that was like, uh, both living on the on the home front, uh, the home front of the war, and having a brother off to war? What? Uh... Well, he had gone to uh, been drafted. Oh. I guess it was about 1942. We had moved to this farm down there west west of Villisca in 1939. And Dad, with uh, seeing double because of one eye lower than the other, he didn't drive the tractor hardly any, so I would go to school during the day and come home. And, and uh, I've spent good many nights where it was 10, 10.30 at night before I'd come in. Wow. And, uh, well, Dad did the things. Uh, he did his milking and uh, fed all the animals and that type of thing. And, uh, well, I went to school and farmed. <laughs> no, I'll be darned. Yeah. But uh, my brother had been in the Philippines, and he... It was quite trying on him, and uh, I still blame that for some of his problems he had in the years when he came home. Hmm. And I don't remember the year right now, but he passed away of lung cancer. Yeah, yeah. How, how was it, uh, you know, you said it was trying for him. How was it for, like, your mom having a son off uh, in harm's way? Was it? Well, it it was, it bothered her a lot. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. 
So you graduated in 46. Uh, what you, you just continue farming then after that? Or uh, well, what, what take your story from, from high school on? Uh, I graduated from high school and things still weren't the greatest in the farming area. And my brother came home from uh, being in the army and uh, he needed a place and I was a footloose and fancy free young individual and one day uh, one of my uh, well one of my my best friend from all the years in high school came driving in oh it was in late in May of 1946 and he says well, we were both basically in the same boat, and uh, he says, let's go enlist in the Air Force. And I said, fine, when do we go? <laughs> and he says, I'll be back tomorrow and pick you up, and we'll go to Shenandoah and see the recruiter. <laughs> now, why of all, all the branches did he focus on the Air Force, or you guys focus on the uh, Air Force? Well... I don't know why he did, but my brother had told me that uh, I had been up for pre-induction physicals and they were going to draft me. I'd been up twice, for, but I had school deferment to finish high school. And my brother told me, he says, you go enlist in the Air Force or uh, I'll, <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> I'll uh, prod you somewhat. <laughs> So, uh, well, now could could you have gotten a, a an agricultural deferment? No, not no. with him home. Oh, okay, okay, gotcha. No. Okay, gotcha. All right. So, uh, oh, we went down and and uh, we didn't waste any time. We were interviewed and and uh, signed the papers. And a week later, we were on a bus from uh, Shenandoah to Omaha where they put us on train to Minneapolis, Minnesota. And we were inducted into, well, given all our physical again and inducted into the, the uh, well, it wasn't Air Force at that time. Still it the was, Air Corps. Yeah. It was military. We were inducted into the military and I held up my hand the first time on the 12th of June, 1946. Uh, wow. <laughs> hmm. And then where'd you go there from there to, to uh, your ba get your basic? Um, uh, before I go there, mm -hmm. at Fort Snelling, Minnesota, of course, there was hundreds of guys there. And there was lots of details that had to be done. I think the worst thing I ever had to do in all my life was go clean a latrine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I never, I never did get stuck on KP there, but uh, we, uh, oh, we had, uh, I guess, a week, ten days. We got to see Saint Paul a little. Saint Paul had a nice. Uh, amusement park down on the banks of the of the uh, Mississippi and there was USO dances and everything and uh, it kind of occupied a little of the time but mm -hmm. after that they sent us by train to San Antonio Texas for basic training in summertime, oh. June and July, in San Antonio, and there we had uh, all kinds of of tests, aptitude tests, and and intelligent tests, and and everything. And I tested out. I was supposed to have gone and been a a crypto repairman. Cryptology is the art of uh, oh, stopping, uh, well, 
coding messages mm -hmm. so that uh, not anybody could pick it up and read it. And they had special machines that uh, would do all this. And lo and behold, I was scheduled to go be a crypto repairman. But when I finished basic, those schools were all full, so they put me in the next level, which was radar. And I'm sure glad they did, because that, that was a lifetime, uh, well, job isn't the word I wanted, but that's what I'm going to use. Yeah. So, so you were put in that primarily due to testing. You, they weren't given, you weren't given the option of what schooling you wanted to go to? It was no. purely by testing? It was purely oh. by testing. Okay. And, and how was that, doing your basic, uh, how was that going from, that transition going from civilian life to military life? Was that much of a transition for you? Well, actually, uh, <laughs> I always said I went on vacation from the farm. <laughs> Basic training was wasn't uh, anything that taxed me. Yeah, yeah. And uh, do do you think as a farm boy you had kind of an edge over like the city boys? Oh, uh, I sure did. Yeah. Way over them. And uh, not only that, when I started basic, I was a six foot, one hundred and forty five pounds, and when I finished, I was still six foot. But I was almost 180 pounds. <laughs> yeah, it mm -hmm. just well, it was a, so much easier. I'll be doing. Yeah. <laughs> now, how was that? I know probably. I imagine growing up, you probably hadn't traveled too far away from the farm. Was there any tinge of homesickness at all, or? Uh... Oh yes, for a while it was. It uh, kind of got to me, but. Uh, now, did you and your buddy go down together? Were you still together down at basic? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my, my friend, was his name was Danny Ramey, and uh, we were inducted both at the same time. We traveled the same train to San Antonio, and we, we had basic training together. And uh, from basic, they shipped us off to Boca Raton, Florida. Oh, wow. And here we were on a troop train in August, and uh, the cars on a troop train, the uh, beds were perpendicular to the side of the train, out so there was still about a three-foot walkway down one side. And this was in the days before air conditioning, so... When you went to sleep at night, you, all the train windows were open, steam engines, burning coal, oh boy. <laughs> and the uh, coal would, uh, the soot from the engine would come flying in the windows, and by morning, your sheet was a nice polka dot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. And uh, can you imagine what was there? Uh, Oh, I don't know, at least 50, 60 people per car. No no shower facilities of any kind. So oh, <laughs> by the time we got to Boca Raton, Florida, we were <laughs> pretty rancid. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. And in Boca Raton is where you went to radar school then? I went to 16 weeks of electronic fundamentals, and that was... Uh, six days a week, eight hours every day, and uh, then uh, after that, well, in between the fundamentals and the radar set itself, there was, uh, oh, it was, lasted uh, a good month. We laid around, we didn't lay around, we was stuck on KP every other day. You'd get up at two o'clock in the morning and go on KP and you wouldn't get through until 10 o'clock at night. Wow. There was, uh, oh, there was four dining facilities on this base and they each one fed 10,000 per meal. <laughs> Three meals a day and, oh, 
and this base was, had been built early in World War II to teach and train guys in electronics. So the buildings were all just, well, we called them tar paper shacks. Mm -hmm. They're just pine boards and, and tar paper on the outside. I can remember one morning waking up and my uh, foot locker was floating around. <laughs> It had been raining so hard that night. Wow. Uh. <laughs> and uh, Boca Raton, or the air base at that time, was right in the edge of the Everglades. And of course, you've always got some crazies when you get that many people on a base. They used to go out in the Everglades and catch alligators. <laughs> we uh, I couldn't believe it. And uh, there, Danny went to a different radar set than I did. Here again, I lucked out and got a radar that, uh, well, they've just recently done away with it. Really? Because wow. of GPS. And uh, Dan went to, it was a automatic tracking radar and gun laying. It would actually pick up an aircraft and fire uh, fire on the aircraft. It aimed the guns and everything. Okay. Uh -huh. But uh, that was a dead-end job. <laughs> like I said, I was lucky I went to the one I did. Hmm. Now you would go uh, to, to re repair the equipment or to operate the equipment? What was your... Uh... I was a repairman. Repairman, okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So uh, you finish up at uh, back, battery t back Retown. Well, uh, after fundamentals, I had eight more weeks on the radar itself. Oh, okay. And uh, it was a 12-ton trailer, four-wheel trailer, and. Uh, so it was a mobile device or a mobile unit then. Well, you pulled it and parked it at a precise angle to the runways. A precise angle and so many feet from the center line of the runway, and that's where the trailer sat. Never did hear of one getting an airplane through it, but <laughs> <laughs> it was close. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. And then where'd you go once uh, you completed all that schooling? Well, when I finished it, well, in between there, at Christmas time, they uh, let anybody have a a leaf for over Christmas that wanted it. Well, there was uh, several of us got together and rented a Greyhound bus to go to Chicago. And everybody was going to scatter from, from there and go home. Well, them rascals, here's all them young GIs going to ride their bus, so they sent an old bus we got up in Georgia somewhere, and the bus quit running at midnight. <laughs> and there we sat until they got another bus to us. <laughs> and uh, like I've always told everybody, and I got to put this in here, yeah. we went on from there to Macon, Georgia. It was breakfast time when we got to Macon, and they stopped at a restaurant. And man, we never saw so many pretty girls in all our life. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, had our breakfast, and we finally did make it to Chicago, and everybody just went to the four winds. I rode a train on out to uh, my home in Iowa, and while I was there, I got strep throat. <laughs> and the doctor who... Uh, had been a military doctor, he uh, he didn't want to take a chance on me not getting well, so he sent me up to off at Air Force Base at Omaha to the hospital up there so that I could get well. Well, <laughs> somehow or other, paperwork fell through the floor, and when I got back to to Florida, I was AWOL. Oh, no. <laughs> 
but it worked out all right. They, the paperwork finally came through, and and they didn't throw me in the guardhouse. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah. Now, had that been the first time you'd been home since you'd left? Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 And got back to Florida and finished the radar school, and then uh, at that time, the overseas uh, uh, base where they selected where people were going was at Kelly Field back at San Antonio, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> so here I went riding the train back and at that time Dan had stayed at uh, the, radar, the radar school because his was a little longer and it was about oh, three or four weeks after I left a uh, hurricane came through and literally flattened that whole base. And he told me, uh, when I, I'll go into it later, but he told me he stood in water halfway up his chest for three days. Wow. Uh. But anyway, I was already at uh, Kelly Field, Texas, waiting for an overseas assignment. And here's a funny little side trip. Uh, when we came in in those days, they gave you the high top leather shoes where the leather had been turned inside out so they were uh, fuzzy all over the outside. Well, some of the guys, like usual, there's always somebody that uh, is into something. Some guy had discovered that he could use lighter fluid and squirt on that fuzzy stuff and burn it off. <laughs> well, a whole bunch of, we didn't have anything to do. They didn't, didn't have any jobs for us or nothing, so we were just laying around walking and what have you. But anyway, so quite a few of the guys did that to their shoes and had them polished shiny. They all got special attention because the shoes being rough that way was on purpose. So they wouldn't reflect any light or anything. And now they had <laughs> shiny shoes that were like a mirror. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I was there, oh, gee, for one of a better figure around a little over a month and they finally decided I was going to Alaska. So I was sent to Hamilton Air Force Base, just north of San Francisco. And there I laid around again, waiting for transportation. And lo and behold, <laughs> besides the Air Force, they were sending Army up, and we were sent to, on a ship. U.S. General C.G. Morton. I'll never forget that. Well, that, that, that begs the question. Here's a, a landlocked Iowa farm boy going to sea. How was that, uh, how was that trip? <laughs> well, I'll tell you. It went from San Francisco to Seattle, where it picked up more people, and then up the inline passage. And this was a seven-day trip from uh, uh, Seattle to Whittier, Alaska. And uh, it was... I don't know, uh, they must have had the granddaddy of all storms while we were going. And the last three days of that ride, I never got out of bed. Oh. <laughs> it, it was just horrible, especially guys wouldn't make it to the head or restroom or out the door. We were clear down, no, oh, about five decks down. <laughs> and it, it was... It was an experience, <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> and uh, got to Whittier, and there again, train ride up to Elmendorf. Well, the Air Force went to Elmendorf. I forget the name of the base where the Army went, and here we laid around again. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, I guess we'd been there a couple of weeks. And there was 
the numbers had dwindled down in my specialty. There was just three of us. And we were called into the personnel office. And they said, well, we've got three places. Who wants to go where? And we asked where. Where is the places? Well, one of them's Shimia, one's Nome, and I can't remember what the other one was. And the other two guys just sat there and didn't say nothing. And uh, I said, well, I'll take Nome. That was the best thing I could have done. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, what prompted you to, to say Nome? Did you have any well, idea what yeah. the differences or? What prompted me to say no, when I was quite young at home, uh, my mother had had a cousin who was a minister. Him and his family went to Nome, Alaska oh, wow. to be missionaries. Uh -huh. And that is why Nome was in my mind. And I knew I didn't, well, I really didn't know a whole lot about Shimia at that time. But I learned afterwards that that place, you have at least 50, 60 mile an hour wind constant. Ugh. It, it, it's really... And that's um, out on the Aleutians, is that yeah, correct? Yeah, way out down yeah. on the end of the yeah. Aleutians. And, and it was... But anyway, uh, the radar set was setting. It wasn't commissioned. And uh, there was... Uh, already three people that did the job the same as mine were assigned there. It was kind of hard to break into the group. <laughs> uh, anyway, we uh, all before snow melted the, the following spring, well this was uh, November when I got there. But before snow melted the following spring, we had the radar out by the uh, runway and commissioned, and it was doing what it was supposed to do. And one thing about this little base, Marks Air Force Base, one thing about that base, it had a single purpose during World War II, and that was our pilots brought P-51s aircraft that was a fighter-type aircraft, mm -hmm. to uh, Nome, and Russian pilots got in them and took them acro on a cross. That'll be darn. Uh, yeah. Uh, and that was the sole purpose for for the base, and the, of course the, uh, the radar enhanced it because your, their closest place they could land was back at Fairbanks, which was, oh, about four hours away. So... They really did need to... So your radar was primarily, your job was primarily for, for our guys. It wasn't to watch like the Russian... Uh, no. Okay. No, it, it, this radar is a landing aid. Okay, okay. And, well, it was more than an aid many a time. They uh, would talk to the aircraft and tell him how to fly to be on the center line of the runway at 10 miles and follow him all the way down. And if he'd start to veer off, they'd give him heading corrections so that he'd stay gotcha. lined okay. up with the yeah. runway. And at the same time, there was uh, glide path information. There was two scopes that were watching. The one to watch the center line of the runway and the other one was a three degree glide path. I'd give them corrections, increase rate of descent or decrease rate of descent to stay on the uh, gotcha. Okay. The yeah. rate of descent. Gotcha. Yeah. What was uh, talk a little bit about life up in Nome uh, in Alaskan winter? What what were your living well, conditions like? And we had uh, they were nice. Oh, they were wooden buildings, but uh, we had no trouble keeping warm. Okay. It was pretty nice and. Uh, Oh, there was one street down through the center of Nome, and uh, the uh, it actually wasn't that cold at Nome. Yeah, yeah. Nome sets right there on the Bering Sea. Bering Sea freezes over to a depth of about six foot, and uh, so that tempers the temperature. 
and uh, well, actually, uh, well, I can only remember one time of seeing 30 below, which normally it stayed above zero. Oh, okay. So Good. it wasn't bad. How, how was it adjusting to uh, the darkness? You know, I can't remember having any problem with really? it whatsoever. Huh. No. Yeah. I'll be done. You, you have more trouble with it being light. <laughs> yeah. Huh. I'll be done. And then how long were you stationed up there? I was at Nome for a year. And, uh, well, let's see. It was... well, let me back up real quick, too. Sure. Uh, your initial enlistment, how long were you? Uh, for a four-year enlistment? Three. Three years. Okay. okay. For initially. Okay. But in, uh, let's see, I came home from up there first part of uh, November, but back in uh, about the end of September of 48, I was all doubled up one morning. I, I couldn't hardly get out of bed. And when I did get out of bed, I couldn't stand up. My uh, cross my belly hurt like the Dickens. Well, I went to the doctor, and they decided it was my appendix. <laughs> we had a little little hospital. There was oh about six bed hospital and two or three doctors, and and so they took took my appendix out up there. Hmm. And then uh, the end of October, I was coming to the states, going to carry all my stuff and my duffel bag. <laughs> I wore the bottom of the duffel bag out, dragging it because I could no way oh, carry right, it oh, right, yeah. after having my belly cut. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and I had asked, uh, oh, Nome was really a, uh, a real nice assignment. Really? Oh, yeah. Huh. And, uh, oh, there was two or three girls in town, white girls, that is. Yeah, yeah. Lots of Eskimos. Yeah, and that must have been uh, an interesting. I mean, here's a, uh, once again an Iowa farm boy uh, up in Alaska with the yeah. Eskimos. That must have been fascinating or interesting. It I would was. Think. Yeah, yeah. And uh, actually, that's where I really got started taking pictures. I had bought a little camera that, uh, well, it had a <laughs> a modified type light meter on it. It had a scale that you could see you. When you looked in the viewfinder, and whichever number you picked out uh, the clearest, that's the number you put on your f-stop, <laughs> and it, it worked real good up there. Mm -hmm. And uh, had that for quite a few years after that. But uh, I guess I was lucky. Uh, like I mentioned a minute ago, there was it was three white girls of eligible age, so to speak, uh -huh. and I was dating one of them, <laughs> and uh, it it helped. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and when I was, uh, at that time, they would ask you where you'd want to go in the States, and I said, I want to go to Lowry at Denver. Well, lo and behold, my assignment came back, and I got Lowry. And uh, flew in a old C-54. Well, they were good aircraft. From uh, no, rode a C-47 from Nome to Fairbanks, where we were stuck waiting for transportation again. And from Fairbanks, rode a uh, C-54 from Fairbanks to well, it stopped at Edmonton, Canada, to refuel. And from Edmonton to uh, Great Falls, Montana, and uh, me and another guy from Nome, we was both going to coming to Lowry. We uh, just got bus tickets and rode the bus down. Now, prior to the Air Force, had you ever been up in an airplane? No. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'd stood beside a Piper Cub, <laughs> but I'd never been up in one. Yeah. Uh. But anyway, uh, we rode uh, the bus down, and uh, now here I'm going to deviate a little bit. That's fine. Danny Ramey 
my friend, mm -hmm. was in the hospital at Fitzsimmons. Yeah. So uh, I uh, wanted to get out there and see him. Well, I went out, and he had TB. And he laid there for over three years. He really? went past his discharge time. But anyway, when he left... Uh, the hospital, the TB was cured, but he was minus two ribs on each side. And uh, for some reason, they sent him to Leavenworth, Kansas, an Air Force man, to yeah. to uh, an Army base. But anyway, he, he got out and went to le Electrical Engineering School in Ames, Iowa. And uh, after he graduated from that, he got a uh, job with McDonnell Douglas in San Diego, where he spent his whole life. He just uh, passed away last summer, mm. almost coincidentally with Mary Ann. I'll be darned. Mm. Yeah, Danny passed. It was last July. I don't remember the exact date. They lived in uh, Escondido, California. And you guys remained friends all those years, huh? Yeah. Yeah, we died. And he had, uh, I believe it was two boys and a girl. I never knew exactly for some reason, but I didn't. And, yeah. And let's see. So now you're here, you're at Lori. Lowry. Oh, yes. I had stopped and saw Danny at Lowry and went back to the squadron headquarters at uh, Lowry. And they said, well, here's your orders. I said, orders? Orders for what? He said, oh, you're going to Rapid City, South Dakota. Huh. I was there. I got the assignment. I stayed eight hours. and <laughs> But that's the way things were in those days. Yeah. And, oh, I forgot something. I was promoted all the way to corporal at Nome, Alaska. When I went up, I was a slick sleeve with nothing, and <laughs> I got PFC very shortly, and, and uh, before I left, I had the two stripes, and uh, went to Rapid City, yeah, rode the bus up there, and uh, got all checked in and everything is established with the new organization, and then I got 30-day leave to since I'd been gone overseas for a year, I got 30 days mm -hmm. at home, down in Iowa. Well, I'd been home a few days, and I was in town one evening, and, and uh, run into Marvin Peterson. He was another one of my good friends from high school. And I said, Marvin, is there any girls around? <laughs> and he thought for just a very short time and says, yeah, I know a good one. She's a sister to the girl I'm going with. And she's teaching school down at Hebron. That's a little town south of Aliska, about oh, 15, 18 miles. And uh, I said, well, let's go go uh, and you can introduce me and uh, so we drove down there and uh, here was another one room schoolhouse she was teaching all eight grades in one room and uh, where the teacher stayed where she lived was uh, in those days they had uh, telephone centrals in homes well, when we got down there, she was operating the switchboard, huh. and before she could come out side and talk a little bit, she had to get the woman of the house to come and sit at the switchboard. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, that was oh, towards the end of uh, 
November in uh, 1948. And uh, so the, the, I believe it was a Thursday, Wednesday or Thursday. Yeah. Here again, if Marianne was here, she could tell you the, yeah, yeah. the date and the exact time. But that was Marianne. She could remember all of that. So, the, oh, that uh, Saturday night, the four of us, the two girls and Marvin and myself, we went roller skating. Well, that must have been the thing to do. because uh, we wrote lots of letters when I was back at Rapid City. In those days, you didn't call on the telephone. Right, right. Uh, it's not like today was... where we've got computers and cell phones and, yeah. No, it was too expensive then. Yeah, yeah. But we wrote lots of letters, and I was back home for Christmas, and... Uh, Oh, I was home another time. I forget just what the month was, but I'd caught a hop on a B-25. Huh. Rode in the nose of it. Wow. <laughs> from Rapid City to Offutt. <laughs> and uh, we became better friends all the time. Oh, uh, the humorous thing that happened on the first date, Marvin had an uh, old 36 Ford. And lo and behold, in the floor, there was one or two little screw holes where the screws had fallen out or something. But anyway, he hit a mud puddle, <laughs> and Marianne got muddy water all up <laughs> on her leg. <laughs> oh, that, that was always a... A funny thing when we the four of us got together <laughs> that was really humorous for us yeah. but anyway when I'd been home at uh, Christmas time New Year's Eve I gave Marianne a diamond oh, I'll be done but anyway like I just mentioned uh, I'd given Marianne a diamond and the two girls, after I'd left, they decided all four of us were going to get married on the 26th of June. Which, uh, well, the 12th of June, I got out of the Air Force. Now, what, this is 49? What year, what year is 49. Okay. 12th of June. 49, I became a civilian, caught a ride to uh, Sioux, yeah, Sioux City, where I rode a bus on down to Iowa, and the uh, 26th, there was a double wedding in uh, the little church in uh, Nodaway where uh, Marianne's parents lived closest to and went to church there. And, uh, oh, I kicked around for a while and was thinking about staying out and being a, a farmer. And the longer I stayed out, the more I decided this didn't look good to me anymore, especially the climate. And uh, it was hot, humid, and just the weather after what I'd seen was just plain miserable. So yeah. we decided, well, I had to get back before the 11th of August to keep my rank. Oh, so this is only like a two-month period of time. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. okay. And, uh, well, it's three months. You or, can, or three months, yeah, yeah. You can be out yeah. and retain your okay. your rank. So we left and was up there in the first part of August, and I re-enlisted 
and uh, and uh, well, I had uh, been promoted to staff sergeant, so I wanted to retain that. But anyway, things were anything but routine with the radar. It had gone off the air about a week after I left. And the, the man that had taken my place, I shouldn't do this. But anyway, he was one stripe more than I. He was a tech sergeant. And he <laughs> had just completely misdiagnosed what was wrong. And uh, after I was assigned back to the organization, I went out to the radar and tuned it up, which is all it needed, and went in and told the maintenance officer he could tell the world his radar was back on the air. <laughs> he literally fell out of his chair because this they had been fighting trying to find this. It was the waveguide that went all the way from the transmitter up to the other corner of the trailer and there was nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with it. Uh -huh. But this man that was the maintenance officer, uh, the commander left, so he became the commander and uh, he became one of my best friends. Is that right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, he, uh, oh, he was sandy haired Texan, little Texan. <laughs> Married to a, a real lady from New Brunswick, Canada. Huh. Just wonderful people. Yeah. And everything went along pretty smooth there. We was at uh, Rapid City. It was 49. And in January 50, I got overseas orders. Alaska. Really? <laughs> and, uh, well, took Marianne back to, she stayed with her parents part of the time. She, uh, to occupy herself, she uh, got teaching jobs because she still had her certificate. And she taught and taught there in a couple different schools where the, the teachers were Oh, being gone for one reason or another for a short period of time. But anyway, I got back up to Anchorage and I'd been there about a week and they hadn't made up their mind where they wanted me. And I decided one day I was going to get an answer. So I'd gotten up and was sitting in the orderly room where all the personnel people are, not many in uh, up there. <coughs> but anyway, the door opens, and who comes in the door but the man that had been my commander at Nome, Alaska <laughs> when I was up there. <laughs> we had a conversation for a little bit, uh, and then he wants to know, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm trying to get an answer where they're going to put me. I said, they can't make up their mind. He says, go get your stuff. You're going back to Nome with me. <laughs> so while up there, I was glad to get there. I hunted downtown and found a little, oh, it was a three-room <laughs> building. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, I had it rented. Excuse me, and uh, Mary Ann flew up. I had we had to foot the bill ourselves because oh, really? there's no dependents allowed up there. Ah, okay. But I had her up there, and uh, one of the guys in the chief operator in the GCA unit. Uh, GCA stands for Ground Controlled Approach. But anyway, he had his wife there. And uh, and she flew up, and uh, we had a 
wonderful time up there. Yeah, did she, so she adjusted. Here's a once again an Iowa farm girl, uh, small town farm well, girl up in Alaska. How was that adjustment for her? Well, here's the thing. The farm in those days didn't have all the conveniences. Oh, okay. They had just gotten electricity. They didn't have any running water in the house. They had to go out to the pump, pump a bucket of water. The bathroom was a little building out by itself. Mm -hmm. And she gets up there, and lo and behold, the bathroom is a chemical toilet in a little room on the back of the house. No heat out there at all. Oh. The cook stove was a big cook stove, just like what was on the farm, but it burnt fuel oil. And their fuel oil, by the time it got up there, for some reason, had water in it. And you'd get the, that uh, stove just a burning real good so she could cook. And all at once, here'd come a wad of water. Oh. <laughs> and we would both plan on leaving. <laughs> it made some such a well. It was a small explosion. Oh wow! Actually, uh. that water into that hot hot stove. And up there, of course, there's no water running water in the winter time because you can't keep the pipes from freezing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we had a fifty five-gallon drum that sat in the kitchen and once a week the water truck came by and they had uh, buckets that were made out of these square uh, five-gallon uh, like military got their lard that way in a five-gallon okay. bucket well they had two of these and they'd carry in enough water to fill your barrel uh, and of course, that country has permafrost. It thaws a little unevenly in the summertime, so our floor went this way. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, where the house was, she could sit and look out the front window right at the jetties of the Nome River where they went into the Bering Sea. And uh, of course, in the summertime, why there was some activity yeah yeah but up there is where she got tired of sitting around and had gone to oh there was a uh one nice big store that like you'd think of as a having everything okay but they didn't have everything yeah, yeah. but anyway she taught herself to crochet and uh I was putting things away in the linen closet the other day, and there's some of these little hot pads. She, the first thing she crocheted, uh -huh. they're white with a red rose in the center, and then a red fringe around the outside. She, she couldn't have started on anything any harder. At least yeah. women that crochet had been crocheting for years told her that, but. She kept herself busy, hmm. and uh, oh, sometimes I had to go to work at night. I'd take her with me, and and uh, she got somewhat of an education of seeing things. The uh, barracks had a wash machine, an old ringer type wash machine. And I'd take our clothes and go out there and wash them, and. Uh, and then bring them home wet, and she had to get them dry somehow. <laughs> uh, and then in uh, October, they decided they didn't need to support that mission up there anymore because there's no more aircraft being flown across. So they decommissioned the radar, and I packed it up. And they said, well, you haven't been here long enough to count for an overseas tour. We're going to send you to Fairbanks. <laughs> oh, man. What a place. Fairbanks. I walked to work one morning. It was 73 below. Oh. <laughs> but had the same type of radar over there that uh, was needed. 
because uh, one thing you had over there is what's called ice fog. And when it gets down around 40 to 50 below, it freezes all your humidity. And it just hangs there as little ice crystals. <laughs> and it's just like having regular fog. You go out and get in your car. Well, you'd always look at the tires. I never changed so many flat tires in all my life. It was the uh, right at the end of World War II, and the rubber all went to military, mm. and, and the, your tires were that butyl substitute. Oh, when it got cold, it would freeze and get little pinholes in the tires. Mm. And if they weren't flat, it took you two miles down the road to get them round again. You'd go, vroom, vroom, vroom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, oh, the sun when it come up in the winter time, it never really quit touching the horizon. <laughs> It'd come up a little bit and just move across and then go back down. And uh, well, I was lucky to start off with for a place to live at Fairbanks. They had 24, no, there was uh, 30 some, 24 foot trailers, house trailers, little trailers, all fixed up in this nice little parking area. And I got one. And uh, <laughs> you could count all the nails in the, uh, on the walls. They'd be a little round head on them of frost. Wow, jeez. I used to uh, have to go out and lay a newspaper by the uh, gas tank, uh, you know, propane, big cylinders, mm -hmm. and set it on fire to get enough so the gas would go in so you could have breakfast. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> and uh, the... Uh, well, these trailers were all set uh, back ends to back ends, and then down in between them was a big wooden trough that they had uh, fuel oil lines in. They had a one-inch fuel line to feed all these little stoves because uh, fuel oil would get so thick it wouldn't run if it was out in the open. <laughs> but... I was lucky. We were lucky. So she joined you and stayed with you in Fairbanks? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We were lucky. She was uh, got pregnant over there. And three weeks before our oldest daughter was born, we got uh, regular family quarters, which was three bedroom, hardwood floors everywhere, two, two floors, and a well, two up in a basement with your washing machine in it, and <laughs> and uh, Rhonda, our oldest daughter, was born at Fairbanks before it was a state even. Wow! Uh. So she can't even be president. Yeah. <laughs> but we survived, and after we moved up there, of course, I was a lot closer to work, and. Uh, I bought a 48 Ford, and I uh, had to, I'd sent to Sears, and you remember the uh, smudge pots they used to put out along the road to mark where they were working on the road? Got one of those that had a, a cover over the flame about so big around and about that high that was a flame-proof thing. I'd light that and set it under the pan on that Ford, carry the battery in the house wow. to get it to start every morning. <laughs> and I never missed. Well, I'd lift the hood and look, look at things. Spark plug wires were about yay big around with frost. <laughs> wow. Just, why it formed there, I don't know, but that was the only frost under the uh, under the hood. Uh, yeah, 
and uh, oh, I forgot one part when we did get to Fairbanks, we had had to stay in an apartment in town because uh, there was nothing available on the base, but we survived that no problem. Yeah. And then and, how long then were you up in Fairbanks? You finished out your assignment in Fairbanks then? Yeah, I was, uh, let's see, it was 52. Uh, April of 52. So you're up there Came, a couple years then? Huh? Yeah, oh yeah. Huh? The tour at Fairbanks was two years. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So... Uh, and you're up there then with the outbreak of uh, the Korean War, then, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we were at Nome when Korea War started. Oh, did it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. On our uh, Korean War started on our first wedding anniversary. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Forgot about that. Yeah. There was a few uneasy incidents, but nothing really happened up there. Yeah. Yeah. So. We were lucky. But uh, coming back to the States again, they asked where I wanted to go, and I said, Lowry. <laughs> Where'd I go? Kentucky. <laughs> yeah, was, by that time, they had uh, not just a, a C-54, they had uh, DC-6s to haul people back and forth, so they'd make it all the way from... Uh, Fairbanks to uh, Great Falls, Montana. Stopped and saw neighbors there. Oh, John and uh, I can't bring her name out. That's fine. Ingr John Ingram and his wife, and they had two boys that later on we ran into them again. But anyway, my assignment was down in Kentucky from, and uh, glory be, they did away with my old radar set and we had an, a new version that was two trailers. And uh, well, after that, I'd been there a while and gotten her pretty familiar with the new stuff. Then they sent me to school again, down at Keesler. That's the electronic school center of the Air Force nowadays. And it was then to get schooling on that new radar, which was quite advanced over the, uh, the old one. It had uh, what was called MTI, Moving Target Indicator. You'd uh, you always had returns from ground on your scope. And when an aircraft would fly over that, it would be washed out and you couldn't track him. Well, this moving target indicator, of course, the ground returns were stationary. And the aircraft was moving. Well, you could, it would cancel out the stationary returns and you could see the, uh, the moving target. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, let me back up once again and ask you, when, when you re-enlisted, was it the thought that, okay, I'm going to make the Air Force my career, or was just, just were you just going to do another enlistment, or had you really thought much about that? Well, at the time, we had uh, thought about just this one more enlistment. The Korean War came along. Uh... President Truman gave everybody an extension, mm -hmm. and that gave me eight years in the Air Force, and we said we might as well stay. Yeah, okay, okay. And uh, I'm glad I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Nowadays, uh, granted, the pay was not like the civilian world was getting, but uh, it's sure nice now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah. Good. It really is. Yeah, and uh, well, I had uh, 
driven to uh, down to Keesler from Kentucky. Well, this base they sent me to in Kentucky was a little bitty air base on the edge of Fort Campbell, Kentucky, which is a paras paratroopers base. Well, they had to have aircrafts for them to jump out of, so <laughs> they had to have ways to get on the ground. So, and, and I, I guess uh, sorry to keep interrupting here, but that that led to a question I should have asked you a while back. You were uh, in the Air Force when it made the transition, broke off from the Army, correct? Yes. And was that much? Uh, was there much going on or much difference in all of that when that when it, that separated? Didn't, didn't even notice. It. Okay. Okay. All right. Didn't notice when it. Uh, okay. Congress passed. Okay. So sorry to interrupt. I just no, I, I should right. have asked, should have asked that back then. That's but, fine. So you're you're here at Fort Campbell, and yeah. take your story from there. And uh, this was not only uh, the paratroopers, but over uh, oh, it was about five miles from us. There was another little base over there that had all these cement buildings that were halfway underground, and they were rounded tops it was bomb storage mm. and uh, three different times while I was there at Fort Campbell I saw as high as 90 B-47s on the ground at one time wow. and they'd bring an article from this other base they'd haul it over there and load it on the on the aircraft and uh, keep track of their time how long it took them and then they'd take it off and take it back. Wow. It was just practice to see how long it was going to take them to get the weapon wow. on wow. its way. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. They were, they were identical with the ones that were used. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Huge like Of course we're talking atomic bomb, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And went to uh, down to school on the newer radar and uh, enjoyed it and uh, enjoyed the new radar and it was a lot a lot better equipment a lot better it was built by both the old and the new it was built by Gilfill and Brothers in Los Angeles but when I finished school I came back to Fort Campbell and uh, or the little air base there then in uh, 55, I got orders for overseas again. Just my luck. <laughs> uh, Newfoundland. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that was one whale of an assignment. That was a place where it was a refueling stop for aircraft from Europe to the States and the States to Europe. And when they got there, they had to get on the ground because their closest alternate was 500 miles away. Mm. <coughs> well, the weather up there, it, that sets right out there in the Gulf Stream. The water is warm. And it would bring all this moisture up. You'd get 200 inches of snow each winter. And uh, better than, a little better than 85% of the time it was IFR. That's instrument flight rules where they can't see. But like I said, they had to get on the ground mm. when they got there. And the uh, when I got there, the people hadn't kept the equipment up and I was working 15, 16 hours a day and now was this in a remote assignment where you did you leave the family behind or did they come well, up with I took them to Villisca when we left okay. uh, Kentucky mm -hmm. and uh, they stayed until I well they had nice family housing up there oh, too okay. Oh, but, okay. uh, but you didn't go up there and get right in it. You yeah. had to find you something in town <coughs> to uh, to live in. But anyway, it was, uh, oh, 
it was October when I went up and uh, I came back well I found a place to live another little three-room building <laughs> and uh, at Christmas time well yeah, it was right at Christmas time. I came back to get the wife, and we had two girls at the time. The little one was uh, just five months old, and we drove from Iowa to North Sydney, Nova Scotia, in the week between Christmas and New Year's. Hmm. Got in a snowstorm, and uh, we had just crossed the causeway from mainland of China on to, oh, what is it, New Brunswick Island, and it was snowing. I couldn't hardly see the front of the car, and but I did catch a light off to my right, and I stopped and went in, and I said, is there any motels anywhere? The guy says, no, there isn't. I said, well, I've got a wife and two daughters, and I need a place to stay. He said, well, you go on up the road here, and he gave me specific instructions. She keeps traveling salesmen during the summertime, and she might put you up. Well, we got up there, and the next morning I found out it was a huge white house. And she took us in, and uh, she even put hot bricks in the bed for us <laughs> Wow! <laughs> and fed us barley soup that night and uh, the next morning got up sun was shining bright on all that new snow it was almost blinding where we drove on to uh, North Sydney Nova Scotia and uh, we got there just when the, the ferry had already gone to over to Newfoundland, so we had to wait a day and a half. And uh, what they did, they'd pick your car up, put it on this ferry, and they went over to uh, Port of Basque. And in the wintertime, you couldn't drive from Port of Basque to Stephenville, where the air base was. So we rode the train, and of course, there was a backlog on cars getting there, so. We had to leave the car, and it came up days later. <laughs> and uh, oh, and the uh, oh, following couple of months or so, I don't remember exactly. I made master. No, it wasn't that soon. It was the next year. I made master sergeant. And the commander says, "Well, your master, you got to go to the." NCO Academy. I says, by this time, the wife was getting cabin fever. <coughs> and I said, well, you authorized me TPA, and I got my hand up volunteer. TPA is travel by private auto. And he says, well, I'll have to work on that. Next month, he comes and says, I got your TPA authorized, and I got your slot in the in the academy. <laughs> so we got packed and uh, drove. This was now summertime. Drove back down to Port of Basque and uh, put the car on the ferry and uh, rode the ferry over to uh, North Sydney. We got in the car and drove to Florida. Wow. <laughs> but in the meantime, we stopped. Oh, Buzzards Bay, Massachusetts. We had real good friends there. Bill and Alda Wilgus. And the last time we had seen them, we uh, met them at Nome, Alaska. And the last time we'd seen them, they had one boy. And when we got to Buzzards Bay, they had four boys and a girl <laughs> <laughs> and of course there was quite a bit of time yeah, in yeah. there and uh, oh well bill had been a 
commissioned officer during World War II, but at the end of World War II, they had more pilots than they needed. That's what he'd been. He'd been a B-17 pilot. Mm. And uh, the, uh, those that wanted to, they cut them back to a master sergeant. And a lot of them became the operator personnel in the, in the radar unit because they knew we're familiar with aircraft. Okay. But we visited them for about three days and then headed on down. Hmm. Drove all the way down to Orlando, Florida, where we spent six weeks. My wife and girls were in a motel. I'd get home, oh, about one o'clock on Saturday <laughs> and go back the same time on Sunday. Oh, boy. Huh. But it was worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, when uh, I... Uh, Oh, yeah, at, uh, when we were back up at uh, Newfoundland, one evening I was a knock on the door and I went to the door and who was there but, oh, the, the man that had been the maintenance officer at Rapid City, <laughs> Charles D. Farmer. Oh, what, a, what an individual he was. Uh. But anyway, <clears throat> he was there and, and uh, we had a good visit. And he was flying what's called flight check aircraft. When up there, they have to go around to all the bases and check all the navigational aids to make sure that they're within the published specifications of where the, uh, they would tell the aircraft where the runway was, everything. Not only the, the radar, but the range stations and everything that way. But the three years came to an end up there and I asked for Lowry. I got Hamilton Air Force Base just north of San Francisco. <laughs> and, uh, well, in the meantime, at, uh, up at uh, Newfoundland, well, when, uh, early in, uh, oh, 55 or 6, I forget, they created two new uh, rank levels for enlisted. Uh, but they also came out with a test that uh, everybody had to take. And I took it not thinking anything of it. I just hurried through it and was gone from the testing I had work to do. And when I got to Hamilton, I wasn't there six weeks, and the commander called me in and says, you made senior. You could have knocked me over with a feather. <laughs> <laughs> Here I hadn't really hadn't paid attention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, but anyway, then I wasn't authorized in the squadron level, so they sent me to the region headquarters or Sacramento, McClellan Air Force Base, and. Uh, Oh, we were uh, there for five years, uneventful, just, excuse me, I got to back up, it was most eventful, our third daughter oh, okay. was born, okay. <laughs> Lisa, <laughs> yeah, Rhonda had born, been born at Fairbanks, Denise, who was, uh, Born on the 24th of uh, July. <laughs> yeah, the year. I believe it was 55. I don't remember for sure. And then Lisa was born on the 4th of March, 61. And uh, we had wonderful family quarters there. They had brand new, what? 
what they called, there was a senator by the name of Capehart had gotten a bill through to, to build new family quarters on bases. But uh, got orders on the, and departed on the th 3rd of October. <laughs> I can't remember the year now for Tokyo. Oh. Yeah. What an experience that was. And I remember the, the misgiving feelings I had when that 707 landed at at uh, oh that has disappeared too but it was in Tokyo southern Tokyo and uh, then we rode a bus about oh it was a good between 30 and 40 miles to the base where we were going Tachikawa and here again we didn't have quarters on the base, but uh, we stayed in a hotel, a Fuji hotel, right outside the base, while I, I found a, uh, a nice little place in, in town, not too far from the base, and uh, that was really an experience. Oh, bad, yeah. But uh, we enjoyed it. And uh, besides our experiences on the base, uh, we became involved with, uh, well, they called it the American People to People program. But we kind of got outside of that. And uh, Marianne was teaching their oldest son English. He was just a little older than Rhonda, our oldest girl, and they had a little boy that was just a little older than Lisa, the little one. But in three years' time, he went from us using the dictionary quite a bit to converse with him to he had a second-class interpreter's license. <laughs> he was brilliant. <laughs> and uh, all the... Uh, a lot of the Americans in that people-to-people -people program, they were charging quite a bit for their teaching time. We wouldn't take anything, and that was the best thing we could have done. Mm. Those yeah. people took us places, and I'd try to get my billfold out to pay for something, and there'd be two hands <laughs> keeping me from it. Oh, <laughs> wow. They, they took us several places and spent weekends and and everything, but uh, now I'm really sad about it. The oldest boy, after we left, got a master's in law from Nihon University in Tokyo, and that wasn't enough for him, so he went to the London School of Economics in London, got another master's in law, and uh, he was back in Japan teaching in the university. And they had a, they had a Japan-wide test for a position in the UN in Geneva. He passed the test. And in uh, 1986, we flew over to Geneva. <clears throat> you know, before that, he had gotten married to a Scottish girl. <laughs> and they had twins, little boy, little girl. Well, in 86, uh, well, it was October, we flew over to visit him in Geneva. And the children called us Grandpa and Grandma. And and we went several places with them. They took us several places. And uh, well, the next year, the UN sent him to Namibia. That's down in the west coast of 
so, uh, almost down South Africa, mm -hmm. about three-fourths of the way down. He was to observe elections. He was killed the first night he was there in oh. a one-car accident. And all of the uh, the whole family is uh, is gone. The next to go was the father. He was about three years older than I, and he got where he couldn't swallow. <coughs> and he was in the hospital, and they didn't give him proper care, and he passed away. Hmm. The younger boy had become a dentist. And he was in great demand for uh, conducting seminars all over Japan and the Philippines and all everywhere over there. But anyway, he uh, had pain in his hip. Well, we know it was osteosarcoma cancer, so he's gone. And related on that subject, Lisa, our youngest girl, had osteosarcoma in the top of her, hmm. the tibia in her left leg. And that's been 19 years ago now. Hmm. And uh, she had chemo for, it was a good three months, real radical, terrible stuff. Every time she went down to Denver for the chemo, she wound up in the hospital. Mm. But anyway, after that first three months, they decided uh, the tumor had shrunk all it was going to, so they replaced her knee. Five inches of donor bone, and she's got a brass plate, and I don't know how many screws in her leg, but you can't tell there's anything wrong with her leg now. Is there right? yeah. Except you can see the scar from here down to the ankle. Uh, I'll be done. Hmm. And that, that is really strange. Here those two, yeah. when, when we were in Japan, those two, they'd run and play. He didn't speak a word of English. She didn't speak, oh, maybe two or three words of Japanese. Do you think there was something environmental there that maybe you've prompted it, that? Uh, I have no idea. Yeah, yeah. No idea, hmm. but her and I wonder yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. But we had not, uh, we eventually moved into really nice quarters over there. They were uh, all cement structure mm. and uh, three, three bedroom and kitchen and living room. And, and uh, they were really nice. I had to uh, invest in two air conditioners, one upstairs and one down because the humidity in Tokyo puts Iowa to shame. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. Oh. It is just... <laughs> and while we were there, of course, I was in the communications electronics depot, overhaul depot, and all the equipment coming in, uh, navigational aids equipment, radio equipment that come out of... Uh, Vietnam came there for repair and overhaul. So while we were there, I had been on every air base there was in Southeast Asia. Oh, geez. Oh, boy. Doing surveys just to determine what our workload was coming so up. So you were in, in uh, obviously in Japan when Vietnam flared up? And... Oh, yeah. yeah okay. Well, this was 71. 71. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, so the war. Okay. This, I was still, yep. somebody had you back in the early 60s. So this is your Tokyo. No, uh, no, no, it was in the 60s. I was in and out of the country. We went to Tokyo in 63 and came home in 66. Oh, okay. Okay. 71 was when I went to uh, Vietnam for the whole year. Oh, geez. <laughs> yeah. But let's see. Uh, where did I leave off? So all in all, the, the Japanese uh, aside, Japan yeah. assignment was a, a good assignment? Yeah. yeah. It was outstanding. 
and the girls got such an education. It's just, yeah, like Rhonda is a, she's not working anymore, but she's a paralegal. Denise uh, had a job in, in Houston, lives in Atlanta, job in Houston. And the last two years of that, she was two levels of supervision below Dick Cheney. Really? How long have you done? Huh. And uh, Lisa's a, well, she taught tenor, kindergarten for many years. And she's now graduated to the first grade. <laughs> Still teaching out at, uh, been teaching 29 years now. Yeah. I can't hardly believe it that uh, my baby's been teaching 29 <laughs> years. That's <laughs> longer than I was in the Air Force almost. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So where did you come back after the, uh, overseas Japan? Where did you get transferred back then uh, from there? Back to the same base in California. Okay. And, uh, of course, there was no more eventful things this time out there until I got orders to go to Vietnam. Mm. And... Uh, well, I didn't get orders to Vietnam. I got orders to Thailand. There was a radar site in the center of a national preserve. And this, there was a good mountain there that they had this radar set on the top of. And they, there was wild elephants and, and tigers and a, you name it, everything up wow. there. Well, I never got up there because when I got over there, I, I went to Korat, that's where I, the headquarters to this radar site, and they said, we're not going to send you up there, we're closing that. So time, or things take time to get turned around, and so they decided I should go to Vietnam to a place called Monkey Mountain. It's, it was another radar site. And it uh, was about 10 miles from downtown Da Nang. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> oh man, what a time. But it was a safe assignment. Here we are on top of this mountain at the end of a peninsula. And there was a whole, I don't know how many army stationed at the bottom of this mountain. And, well, we worked on top of the mountain, but we lived at the base of the mountain. And uh, I was maintenance superintendent for the whole place. We had, I had everything to maintain, just like a small town. Mm -hmm. Besides the radar equipment itself, I had uh, the water purification, diesel generators for electricity, and uh, all aircraft were controlled <coughs> from this radar site. All aircraft in Southeast Asia, including the civilians' aircraft. Wow, jeez. Well, it was. And when I finished up there, oh man, they sent me to Osco to Michigan. So the Viet your Vietnam tour was pretty uneventful. I mean, it was, yeah. Other than working yourself to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it. Uh, well, I guess the biggest thing that happened, uh, I lost two generators <laughs> at the same time, and we only we had three. They were huge things. V twelve diesels. Hmm. To. Uh, but it was basically pretty good for me. Uh, of course, the radar equipment had to be air conditioned. And there was one barracks that had four, five rooms in it, and all the top NCOs lived in that. And the poor old air conditioner years ago had run out of parts. So they had just bypassed all kinds of stuff on it, so there was no temperature control on it anymore. <laughs> you had to sleep under a 
<laughs> electric blanket. <laughs> In Vietnam. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. Yeah. even if even the guys that didn't have air conditioning, they had electric blankets on their bed to keep them dry. The humidity oh, was uh, worse than Tokyo. Oh, geez. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And here you joined the Air Force to escape the Iowa <laughs> humidity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. But uh, and the reason this place was called Monkey Mountain, there, uh, on that mountain is what's called a rock ape. There, the big ones, big males, are just almost as big as a man. Really? Yeah. And the fur around their face right here is pure white, and the rest of them is orangey. And their hands and arms, this is white up to here. Huh. And then it goes into the orange. And they were very uh, skittish. You very seldom get to see them. If you got to see any, they were way up in a tree, bending the tree over, going from tree to tree. <laughs> uh -huh. it, it was, that was an education. Uh -huh. Yeah. But uh, you said you were, your location, you were safe, you were, yeah, never came under, yeah. but didn't you say you had traveled around to various sites? Uh, well, when I was in Tokyo oh. before, see, this was 71, okay, and I yeah, spent the yeah, whole year there. Yeah. And, uh, well, talk a little bit about that, the, the, the Tokyo assignment when you would go to Vietnam to the various sites. Was, well, I was just doing surveys to, to uh, get my finger or hand on... Uh, the workload that was coming up, finding okay. out how much was coming. But it really, at, at that point, it, the war hadn't really flared up yet then, had it? Oh, yes. Oh, it had, okay. Oh, yeah. Oh. That was uh, 64 and 65. Oh, oh okay, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, right. Yeah. Think of it. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And then, uh, out of Vietnam, they, oh, they sent me to Osco to Michigan. I hate to mention it, but uh, <laughs> the youngest daughter has had asthma pretty bad oh. at that time. And we weren't there a week, and she was in the hospital mm. with asthma. And the maintenance officer was a brand new second lieutenant that, uh, and I was used to working for full colonels. Uh, after about three months, I said, that's it, fellas, and went and put in for my retirement to be effective in, uh, after I had 26 years in, that's the last good pay raise. So then you put in for your uh, retirement and got that, and yeah. where did you guys go then uh, from there? Came right here. Oh, is that right? We had picked this house out in June <clears throat> of uh, oh me man come on memory <laughs> uh, 72 in June of 72 we'd been in Iowa one of uh, the other bride's girl her oldest daughter got married and uh Rhonda, our oldest daughter, was one of her bridesmaids, and we'd come down from Michigan to the wedding, and we had decided we'd just drive on out here and have some look around, because this is where we were going to come, no matter what. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, okay. And uh, we did a lot of looking here in a few days, found out we could buy a new house cheaper than an old one. And this was just two befores. Wow. And we we bought it. Another humorous incident there. Uh, we, uh, well, we signed all the papers and had uh, minimal copies of stuff. Well, when we uh, got back up in Michigan one day, here came a big envelope and it was full of the real estate stuff. Well, 
I got to looking, and it wasn't my name on it. It was up the street up here. <laughs> they, we had both bought houses at the same time, and they reversed. Oh, geez. <laughs> and we're back here in church, in Sunday school, and who's in Sunday school but these people? <laughs> Uh, I can't say their last name now. Yeah. Boy. That's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that was really a coincidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh. Yeah. And uh, oh, since we've been out here, well, I, once I retired from the school, well, after we got here, I went to work in a two-way radio shop out east of town that uh, paychecks started getting further apart. And uh, he had sent me over to the, that little airport out there to put a radio in an airplane one day. Well, the guy liked my work. So I moved to the airport and was fixing those radios, plus uh, I knew the uh, ground portion of the navigational equipment so it was nothing for me to go to work on the airborne portion it was a total of about three years and and uh, a job opened up in Pooter R1 the shop that maintained the educational media equipment okay and uh, well I wasn't too happy with the salary and didn't take it. But three months later they came looking for me. The salary was up. <laughs> and uh, I spent 13 years over there. Uh -huh. There was, uh, when I retired from over there, <clears throat> there was uh, three of us in the shop and we had 2,000 computers in classrooms. Wow. Uh -huh. So but now, was that much of an, uh, going back to a, a question I asked you in the very beginning, was it much of an adjustment after 26 years in the military to adjust to civilian life again for you, or was, uh, was that a pretty good, pretty easy transition? Well, I, I uh, managed to accept it. Also, since uh, I retired, we've done a lot of traveling. Yeah. And uh, we've had traveling partners, a couple that, uh, uh, well, we always called him Dick Marple and Tammy Marple. And we had met these, this couple in Tokyo. We knew them in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And when we came back to uh, the base in California the second time, it was about four or five months later, one day they moved in right down the street from us. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Marianne and Tammy were the very best of friends. And I have to uh, expound on something else here. Dick uh, liked to play the lotto. And... Uh, he had uh, numbers, the same numbers he played all the time, and one of the numbers was supposed to be their wedding anniversary. He was one day off on their wedding, remembering their wedding anniversary, and he won nine million dollars. <laughs> but uh, oh, we've. When I, re the day I retired from uh, the school district here, the next day we picked them up at, uh, down at the airport and I had bought a full-size van and we just headed south. We wound up clear down, way down Florida and uh, I guess we was gone about a month <laughs> and uh, Always, oh, we've traveled with them uh, two, three times a year. 
And now it's pretty ironic. About the same time that Marianne was diagnosed with uh, leukemia, Dick started having terrible headaches, just terrible headaches. And he has pleurisy. And it has progressed really bad, really fast, mm. and he can't even get out of bed by himself now. Mm. And uh, I talked to Tammy quite a bit. She's she needs a helping hand, and uh, but it's one of those things, I guess. Yeah. Mm. So. And actually, I guess this kind of completes, well, actually, uh, one more thing. I was in the Air Force, at, right in the Air Force for 26 years and 20 days. And I thought I was through, but no, they kept me in the reserves for four more years. So I got a total of a little over 30 years now. Wow. And... Uh, I believe that's about it for... Okay. Well, just a few more questions along the lines of family. you, you got the three daughters, uh, uh, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. The oldest daughter, uh, Rhonda, married Dan Rassler. He was, he was from Roseville, California. That was real close to uh, the air base there. And they... Uh, presently live in San Jose, and they had two children, a boy and a girl. The boy uh, blames me because he became a, a pilot, <laughs> and he flies the Gulfstream G4 and G5, which is a, a very special aircraft. And uh, I don't know, he's been around the world one time with it. And the girl, she married uh, David Seals. She's five, about five, six, and he's six foot eight. <laughs> and they live in, uh, in Roseville, California, in the part that wasn't even thought of being a town when we were out there, it has just exploded. And they have our great grandson, mm -hmm. who was was born on all our wedding anniversaries. Is that right? The twenty sixth of June. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Marianne and I were down at Durango riding the the Silverton train, and uh, Denise doesn't have any children. Lisa, well. Uh, Denise is married to Brian, uh, oh, mercy me, what's his last name? <laughs> <laughs> I'll think of it after yeah. a bit, but uh, he's an electrical engineer, and he works for uh, Phillips Electronics, the medical division, and he is doing basically the same job with them supervising teams in the field installing uh, medical equipment and that's basically what I was doing mm -hmm. except it was navigational aids equipment mm -hmm. when I was uh, supervising teams in the field. Oh and Dan Rassler works in uh, <laughs> Palo Alto for EPRI, the Electrical Power Research Institute and uh, I guess, I believe his main field with them is fuel cells. And he gets called all over the world to give seminars on those. Mm, wow. And Lisa, here in town, she had two children, a girl and a boy. The girl is in uh, her senior year at the University of Missouri and she uh, changed her major from journalism to early childhood development 
and wants to be a teacher, just like her mother. And her grandmother before that. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the boy, he's a sophomore in uh, high school, and uh, he's the number one tennis player for Fossil Ridge High School. Does real well. Well, we do. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, well, and Scott, he works for this uh, company. They do inspections. It's called Safe Built, and uh, he is more or less a public relations type person who out beating the bushes looking for new help and. Uh, but the company inspects buildings as they're being built so that they meet all the uh, required standards. So fortunate, I can't believe. Yeah. Yep. I guess Mary Ann did a good job. <laughs> and and you, you said you lost her uh, last year after 62 years of marriage? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And kids and everyone who may see this, <clears throat> it took four completely different different cancers to get Marianne. Mm. The first was lymphoma. And the second cancer was uh, stomach cancer mm. that showed up after the lymphoma. So she left half her stomach at the Mayo Clinic. And the next was uh, cancer all the way across her bottom lip, which uh, was had her surgery at the Mayo Clinic for that. And then the leukemia. And that was it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, she passed 28th of uh, July, 2011. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Ben, we'll, we'll start to wind down this interview. Uh, is there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about or any other stories that have kind of floated to the top of, as you and I have been talking so that ideally we've we've covered your story as best we can or do you think by and large we've we've pretty much covered it? I think we've pretty well covered yeah. it. Well, the, the last question I always like to ask in these interviews is how do you think uh, your military, getting into the military, your military career changed your life, affected your life, played a role in your life? I mean, ever thought about what you hadn't done, what it would have been like if you hadn't done the military, or how would you answer something like that? Well, actually, I believe it was the best thing I could have done. Even though I had gotten a state farmer degree in the Future Farmers of America when I was in school, I think uh, I wound up with the best career. And, uh, well, Marianne and I both love to travel, and uh, we liked moving, and uh, we were both getting itchy feet when we couldn't get up and, and go on a trip here. So uh, I still feel that the military was the best, and uh, I retired as a chief master sergeant, which is as high as I could go, and uh, I have no complaints at all. Oh, very good. Well, I want to thank, thank you for sitting down to tell your story today, but just as important, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Well, thank you. This is the uniform that I wore the last day I was in the Air Force. And I could still go to work and wear the same thing, except 
they have changed the stripes since I got out and the new stripes would look like this okay which is pretty close to being the same except it's got another bar on top could you uh, describe a little bit of uh, some of your decorations here uh, hey. well excuse the interruption there as I started to say these were the decorations I earned while in the service top row clear on the left is a bronze star which uh, completely surprised me after I left Vietnam it uh, I evidently did a pretty good job that they were really satisfied with hmm. next to the bronze star is a commendation medal with oak leaf cluster which uh, was awarded for three different uh, assigned work jobs or that uh, I had done while stationed different places and the next one with the green and white stripes it is also commendation uh, medal which was uh, awarded for my uh, work in Newfoundland and then comes the uh, the ribbon that uh, denotes the uh, the twenty some twenty six years I was in, and then a good conduct medal for uh, all the years I was in. And I'm not going to run through all the rest okay. of them. And up here in the uh, upper right hand corner is the the little ribbons that you wear on your uniform. You don't, well, if I had a dress uniform, I'd wear those uh, ribbons down below, or medals down below on it. But on the everyday uniform, like you saw a little bit ago, that's these ribbons in the upper right corner is what would be worn. Now the insignia uh, down here below is. Uh, oh, was... that is that round uh, patch there. Is, the letters on it are AACS, and that stands for Airways and Air Communication Service. That was the name of the organization that I spent the majority of my time in the Air Force in that organization. Yeah. It's a very nice case. That was a citation that accompanied the Bronze Star that I received for my full year in Vietnam. Oh, that was me. <laughs> About uh, pretty close to the time that uh, I retired. Well, there's Benjamin and Mary, as Marianne always used to say, not always, but quite often would say, our names are out of the Bible. Huh. And down here is uh, Benjamin and Mary and Rhonda here, and Denise and Lisa our three daughters. This is the wall of, of family, mainly youngsters. There's Lucas, Christina, Melinda. Oh, there's Lucas. I, Eric, I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's Rhonda when she was a young lady. And there is Lisa when she got married. 
And over there is Rhonda again when she was pretty small. And right below is Denise. And then uh, Lisa again at her wedding. And in the center is uh, Denise. And below her is uh, Lisa when she was a singer in high school. And here's the whole clan one Christmas. And there's Denise again.